Welcome to the Green Left Report, media for the 99%. I'm Mel Barnes. And I'm Simon Butler. This show, we'll look at how Australia's mainstream politicians and corporate media denigrate those who flee here from war, torture and persecution. We'll ask a panel of refugee advocates what a humane refugee policy would look like. And we'll speak to Malaysian socialist Chu Chong Kai about the huge democracy protests that have recently rocked his country. We'll also ask him about what Malaysians think of the Gillard government's plan to deport refugees there under the so-called Malaysia Solution. But first, our activist news. More than 400 people rallied in Sydney on July 16 to show their support for WikiLeaks and its editor-in-chief, Julian Assange. Maritime Union of Australia Sydney branch President Paul McAleer was one of the speakers at the rally. We must always remember that Bradley Manning is still behind bars while we are free. WikiLeaks, Manning and Assange, continue your fight. The MUA Sydney branch will be with you all the way. Fred Fuentes from the Latin America Social Forum also spoke at the rally. He said many Latin Americans know Assange has good reason to fear the US empire. As Latin American solidarity activists, we know of the long history of attempts to silence, assassinate, kill individuals and entire peoples that have tried to rise up against US imperialism, against the role of the US in Latin America. Military dictatorships that have come on the backs of tens of thousands of people being killed, all of them funded by the US. Why on earth wouldn't they want to get Assange? Tasmanian forest conservationist Miranda Gibson has broken the Australian record for the longest tree sit protest. She's now passed 220 days. When Gibson began her protest in December in the observatory, she said she would stay until Tasmania's high conservation value forests were protected. I'm sitting here on a platform 60 metres above the ground. This tree is in the middle of a forest that was promised immediate protection four months ago now by Prime Minister Julia Gillard. Yet this coop and 34 coops across that area earmarked for protection are up on the chopping block. I'm personally determined to stay here up in this tree and watch over this forest. Looks like I won't be putting my feet on the ground for some time now. For more details, visit Miranda's blog, observatory.org. In recent weeks, refugee hysteria in Australia has reached a new high. Labor and the Coalition have both claimed Australia needs to stop the boats to save lives, with their solution being offshoring refugees to Malaysia or Nauru. Joining us to talk about refugee rights in Australia is former asylum seeker Hadi Husseini, who spent 13 months in detention in Australia, Diane Hiles from Chill Out, and Jay Fletcher, who writes on refugee rights for Green Left Weekly. Welcome to you all. Thank you for being here. Both the major parties and the corporate media claim that the only solution to refugees is to send them offshore to either Malaysia or Nauru. The Greens in particular have been attacked quite fiercely for their opposition to that plan. Is offshore processing the answer and, and why are the Greens being attacked? The media spin on the, on the issue is, is casting the Greens in the light of being incapable of negotiating and um, sticking to, to one principle, the fact that it's the principle of international law, the fact that it's um, Labour Party policy doesn't get mentioned. The opposition in particular is being rewarded for harsh policies. All reasons seems to have gone out of the window. Offshore processing is really the government's code for never resettling these refugees or resettling very, very few. These refugees will either be dumped in Malaysia where they'll disappear in a system that is overwhelmed by more than 90,000 refugees residing there currently. You can't imagine that 800 people getting sent there are going to be protected or looked after. They're just going to vanish. By contrast, the coalition is proposing to send them to Nauru where they'll live in terrible conditions and quietly be deported. And I think it's also important to look at the government's other cruel, policy, um, cruel measures and policies to really understand that this is about not wanting refugees to come at all. And that includes turning the boats around. Tony Abbott declares that it will be the cornerstone of his refugee policy, but the Navy has requested that boats be turned around back to Indonesia under Labor as well. And that, and that led to the June 2021 sinking of a boat that killed 90 people. Deportation is also a massive issue. It's currently being fought in the High Court by more than 100 refugees who are desperate not to get sent back to their, their homes where they know they are not safe. 
and the outcome of that case could, could affect the lives of hundreds. We have to acknowledge that this is an extension of the, fa the racism of, of John Howard's era. Mm. And all we're talking about is short-term knee-jerk fixes which won't save lives. Refugees, they're a key scapegoat that are used by both Labor and Liberal governments to dodge responsibility for, for other policies that, that hurt mm. Australian people and hurt working people. And the fact that Greens maintain a principled stand in support of refugees undermines their ability to do that. A huge point of agreement between the two big parties is support for mandatory detention. Hardy, I wanted to ask you, as a former detainee, what is it like to be in detention centre? As of my experience, as someone who spent 13 months in detention, I had lost contact with my family, I had a very really long journey, and got Christmas Island. They treat us as a someone who did a big crime. They treat us as someone who has no anything right to live as a human. And it was a big shock for me because whenever someone doing something wrong and they are in a jail or prison, they know what they did and they know what they, why they are here. But it was a big question for me and my friends. We didn't understand why we were there. Our situation in Afghanistan wasn't like to let us to find a way to apply for a visa. Were the people who you knew who suffered psychologically? I can say I was one of the person who got mental problem. I spoke with the psychologist and I said, I have dream of my family every time because I haven't seen them for a long time. And the psychologist said, she was professional. She said, if you want to live in Australia, you have to forget your family. And it's very hard even communicated with people who are in the town because they have lots of problems. You can see a lot of children staying in detention for months and months and months. And we haven't got anything to do as an education, any places to make ourselves busy. It was worse than prison, I think. Mm. Diane, there are hundreds of children in these prisons. Well, it's, it's quite a clever strategy at the moment because they say children are not in the detention centres but they're in the alternative places of detention which are high security facilities which are by no means can be called normal accommodation. We've got 700 children who are being deprived of their freedom of, of normal development in our immigration detention centre. As Hadi says, the huge strain is the indefinite nature the fact you don't know how long you, you're going to be there. Last time round, we had children on Nauru for the four years that it was in operation, and they're never going to get that four years of their childhood back. We have to increase the number of family reunion places, and we have to increase it um, particularly for children who are here on their own. What would a humane refugee policy look like if, if Australia was to follow its obligations under international law? I'd like to hear from all three of you. What do you think Australia should be doing? They could process our case and they could let us to live in this community. It was great if they didn't keep us in detention for such a long time. Most of the refugees who spent time in detention, they got mental problem. I released a year ago, I still think about detention. I still got the story from detention with me. No one can guarantee Afghanistan is safe for me or anyone. They should let these people to live peacefully. When I opened my eyes in the world, I was a refugee. I was born in Iran. And since that time, it was my problem. If you believe humans are the same, if you believe you're going to help people, you should be true with yourself. Chill Out um, today has joined a, a coalition of, of the major advocacy groups in calling for specific points to the expert panel. They are immediate resettlement of 4,000 people from Malaysia, 1,000 from Indonesia, stronger investment in UNHCR in certainly Malay, Indonesia, so that people who are seeking protection can be kept safe. And the other thing is, we are in Afghanistan fighting. We have another responsibility to support people from Afghanistan. I think that one of the most confronting aspects of current refugee policy is this idea of border protection, that we're protecting our borders from these refugees. And that goes so far as to say that certain groups of people, entire groups of people like Hazaras, like Tamils, like Rohingyas from Burma are considered high risk categories and Australia will never give them a visa. We need to overcome those notions that it's about protecting our borders and focus our primary concerns on 
providing protection, permanent protection and resettlement. We need to decriminalise the act of bringing refugees to Australia here safely to do away with this idea of people smugglers and we need to we need to be providing those those safe avenues for refugees to get here we need well resourced community based processing centers in in Indonesia and Malaysia where refugees can go to be immediately recognized processed and then flown here and brought here and then once they are here obviously we need to treat them humanely and and like people so that means doing away with mandatory detention and allowing refugees to live in the community while their claims are being processed and while they live in the community they need to have the same rights that Australian citizens have and that means access to to social security housing health education employment opportunities and obviously uh, extensive and extra support for for things like post-traumatic stress thanks to all of you for joining us on the green left report now for some more activist news. Coles warehouse workers in Somerton, Melbourne began an indefinite strike on July 10. The workers say they want the same paying conditions as similar workers at other coal sites. We're going to the coal supermarket in the CBD to support the toll workers. In solidarity with the workers that are um, on strike at the moment in Victoria. that if Coles gets away with putting the workers in that warehouse on lower wages conditions via a subcontractor, but they want to generalise it. Workers' rights are under attack. What do we do? Stand up, fight back. Workers' rights are under attack. What do we do? Stand up, fight back. About 500 people camped for four days near Roxbury Downs in South Australia for the Lizard's Revenge anti-nuclear protest and festival against BHP Billiton's plans to expand the huge Olympic Dam uranium mine. Give us the moment. Always was, always will be Aboriginal land! Always was, always will be Aboriginal land! Green Left TV's Zebedee Parks provided that footage. In late May, the website gassyleaks.com uploaded footage of methane gas bubbling to the surface of the Condamine River near Chinchilla in Queensland. Origin Energy, which owns several coal seam gas wells close by, said the gas plumes are a completely natural phenomenon. The Queensland government said it agreed with Origin. Here's some footage of this so-called natural gas leaking in the Condamine. So they're high, those. They're really high levels of gas. In the middle of the creek, in the middle of the river, sorry, the Condamine River. Meanwhile, local doctors say up to 19 families that live near coal seam gas wells in Tara, Queensland, have suffered from nosebleeds, sore eyes, nausea, vomiting, rashes, and diarrhea. Affected residents have called for a full independent inquiry into the health impacts of coal seam gas. While to the Australian government, Malaysia is little more than a potential dumping ground for asylum seekers. The Malaysian people are currently involved in a huge people power movement. The Bursi democracy protests, Bursi meaning clean, has rocked Malaysia. To talk about the growth in people's power, we're joined by Chu Chong Kai, a leading activist with the Social Party of Malaysia, who's touring Australia. Welcome, hey. Chong Kai. Hey. We just spoke to Australian refugee activists about the plan to send asylum seekers to Malaysia. What's your thoughts about that plan? I think it's a bad idea. The Malaysian government not recognise uh, refugee officially. Mm -hmm. uh, Malaysia is not a signatory of the Refugee Convention. Yeah. And um, the refugees and also undocumented migrants in Malaysia facing a lot of problems. 
um, including uh, harassment, uh, detention, abuse by the authority. For refugees, even they got recognition from the United Nations, they are still facing problems for getting jobs uh, and also access to education and health care in our country. It's uh, basically Australian government dumping uh, refugees uh, to Malaysia and uh, let them be tortured by the Malaysian government, which is so notorious in uh, dealing with uh, Malaysia refugees. Has, there's a lot of refugees in Malaysia, yeah. isn't there? Yeah, That's it's like 80, 90,000 right. of refugees mm. and they are facing a lot of problems besides the torture and also uh, harassment from the authorities. They are also facing difficulties to live their life. The way Australian government are dealing with the refugees is like a kind of a refugee imperialism mm. uh, imposed on uh, Malaysia. Also wanted to ask Chiang Kai about the big protests, huge protests in April. 300,000 people in Malaysia and more than 80 protests around the world on the same days in support of the Bursi movement. Could you give us a sense of what's happened with these protests and why are so many Malaysians taking part? I think uh, Malaysia now is in a very interesting time. The Bursi movement has been started since 2007 when about 30, 40,000 people took the streets uh, to demand for free and fair election. And because uh, there's a lot of uh, frauds and also corruption in our electoral system. But the electoral reform never took place. So this, the Bursi movement continued to call for big rallies. So last year, 2011, in July, despite of uh, massive repression before the rally, but still uh, at least 50,000 people took the streets. Still, the electoral reform is very slow, and the Bursi movement called for another rally in the, this year, in April 28, where at, at least 100,000 people took the streets. And also all over the countries, there are rallies, uh, small and big rallies, solidarity rallies uh, by Malaysians and all over the the world. This was a great awakening of the democratic uh, movement. Political activists and socialists have faced repression in Malaysia. In Malaysia today, is there repression against socialists? Yeah, of course, as uh, our party, the Socialist Party of Malaysia, we have been denied um, registration as a political party for more than 10 years. Only we got the registration in 2008 because of the ruling parties lost a lot of seats in the parliament, so they have to make some concession and this is one of it. Last year, there was a massive crackdown. Uh, PSM activists um, were detained accused of waging war against the king. Six of us, including myself, and also a, a member of parliament from our party, uh, were detained under the emergency ordinance. And how long were you detained for? Detained for more than a month. And no charges? Uh, no. Because of the success of the Bursay rally, it showed that people already overcome the fear of the repression. And uh, then the, the government forced to release us because the, after the Bursi rallies, there are uh, massive campaigns uh, to, to call for our release. Uh, candlelight vigils every night in, in front of the police stations, in the public spaces. Because of the people, people power, we, we are, six of us have been released. I also wanted to ask about another example of people power in Malaysia now, which is the biggest environmental protest in Malaysian history, I think. A proposal from an Australian company, Linus, to build a rare earth refinery in a place near Kwantan in, in Malaysia. Could you tell us about why is there so much opposition in Malaysia to this rare earth refinery? Malaysian government is, is they are like welcoming um, investments uh, from all over the, the world, not to um, help the Malaysian people, but it's for the crony capitalists to gain more profits. And um, a lot of hazardous uh, projects, uh, industries has been set up. The Linus projects, which will pr produce radioactive uh, waste, as well as other other projects like um, the mining, gold mining using cyanide. This kind of uh, projects is just benefit the small elites, but the overall population will suffer. So that's why it creates a lot of uh, public anger uh, towards the projects. Linus says this project is completely safe. Is it going to be safe for the people who live in Kwantan? This is just a one-sided uh, information because they are experts telling that this is uh, you, there's not 100% um, not safe and there are risks of this uh, um, the, the, the leaking of the, this waste. Well, thank you so much for joining us, John Kai. It was fantastic. So that's the end of this episode of the Green Left Report. Until next time, you can keep up with the media for the 99% by subscribing to Green Left TV's channel on YouTube or by visiting us on Facebook. And please consider a donation to our special appeal. We need to raise $60,000 in two months to get Green Left TV off its feet. We've had a great response so far, raising more than $15,000. Until next time, goodbye. Goodbye.